I mean, in further, which sort of goes to what Charles was trying to drop, um, it is an accident of history, or perhaps no accident, that Great Barrington, Massachusetts is the birthplace both of W.E.B. Du Bois and of the educational innovation known as early college. <laughs> the work of the Bard early colleges here and nationally to bring the liberal arts to younger scholars across backgrounds and contexts is entirely informed by, and I would go as far as to say predicated upon, Du Bois's gesture toward, quote, higher individualism which the centers of culture protect and respect for the sovereign human soul that seeks to know itself and the world about it, that seeks a freedom for expansion and self-development, that will love and hate and labor in its own way, untrammeled by old and new alike. W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard in 1895. He served as editor of the NAACP's newspaper, The Crisis, and was author, among other culture-shifting texts, of The Souls of Black Folk, which has held a place in our core curriculum here for decades. Over the years, Bard College at Simon's Rock, which is the nation's first and only four-year residential early college, has also sought to honor the memory and legacy of this native son of Great Barrington by establishing the W.E.B. Du Bois Collection in, Af in African American Literature and History in our library establishing W.E.B. Du Bois scholarships, and hosting, thanks to a generous gift from the Spring Foundation, the W.E.B. Du Bois lecture series, which is this. Each year since 1996, the W.E.B. Du Bois memorial lecture series has invited a distinguished speaker to campus whose own personal and academic achievements follow the tradition set forth by Du Bois himself. And I'll say, I was, um, as a, as a student here, um, I was at the first Du Bois lecture. Um, it was not in this building. This building did not exist. Um, this is the 20th anniversary of the lecture series. Uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, Jr., joins a list of distinguished, distinguished speakers in this series, including historian David Levering Lewis, linguist and Simon Rock alum John McWhorter, artist Faith Reingold, and Albany Law School president Penny Ann. You'll hear more about Dr. Lafayette's remarkable career from our own Anna Dwyer in a moment, but I'll share for now that my conversations with him today have been extraordinarily meaningful and exciting, and I was proud to be able to promise him a deeply curious, engaged, and welcoming audience here at Simon's Rock. For visitors to campus, it is my responsibility and pleasure as provost to say that if you have young people in your life between 8th and 11th grade who are looking for a challenge, send them our way. We'd love to get to know them. Uh, Anna Dwyer is our Dean of Academic Affairs and will introduce Dr. Lafayette. Thanks for being here. Resolution, I am honored to be able to introduce Dr. Lafayette. And as a community, we are very fortunate to have the renowned civil rights activist, educator, minister, and peace advocate here speaking with us tonight. Dr. Lafayette is perhaps most widely known for his activism in the 1960s and his close work with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He co-founded the Student Nonviolent non Coordinating Committee one of the most important organizations of the American Civil Rights Movement. He was also a leader in the National Lunch Counter Sit-Ins, he was a freedom writer, and he was one of the primary organizers of the Selma to Montgomery March. He directed the Alabama, Alabama Voter Registration Project, and in 1967, Martin Luther King appointed him to the position of National Program Administrator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Soon after, Dr. Lafayette brought King's nonviolent approach to social justice and change to Chicago as coordinator of the Poor People's Campaign, which he continued to work on after King's assassination. Today, Dr. Lafayette continues to be recognized as a, as a major authority on strategies for nonviolent social change and one of the leading advocates of nonviolent direct action in the world. He has served as Director of Peace and Justice in Latin America and Chairperson of the Consortium on Peace Research, Education, and Development. 
An ordained minister, Dr. Lafayette earned his BA from the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville and his doctorate from Harvard University. He has served on the faculty of Columbia Theological Seminary and is dean of the Graduate School at Alabama State University. He was also principal of Tuskegee Institute High School and a minister of the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Tuskegee, Alabama. He has served as president of the American Baptist Theological Seminary and established a peace education program at Gustavus Adolphus College. Dr. Lafayette is also the founder and national president of the God Parents Club, a national community-based program aimed at preventing the systematic incarceration of young black youth. In addition to all his professional activities, Dr. Lafayette has also found time to write and has numerous publications on nonviolent social change and activism for peace, including his most recent book, In Peace and Freedom, My Journey in Selma, which is for sale outside after this talk. Dr. Lafayette was appointed the Distinguished Scholar in Residence and Director of the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies at the University of Rhode Island and the Chairperson for the International Nonviolence Executive Planning Board. He also held the position of Chairman for the Rhode Island Select Commission on Race and Police Community Relations. Most recently, Dr. Lafayette is the Distinguished Senior Scholar in Residence at Emory University and he continues to serve as chair of the National Board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. To paraphrase the words of Martin Luther King, which are so relevant still today, the question that we face is this. In the light of the fact that oppressed people of the world are rising up against their oppression, how will the struggle for justice be waged? And in considering this question, we are truly blessed to hear the insights of Dr. Lafayette tonight. to be awake, 
you can stay awake. <laughs> and that's where I am now. I'm no ways tired. Okay? <laughs> you have inspired me. The question is whether well, you're going to be able to stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Because <laughs> I'll be awake. So we'll see. All right. Uh, down to business. I have had the uh, great opportunity to visit with so many uh, subunits of your, your college and your community, uh, including staff people, and of course, you know, how can you compare being able to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with your provost and other uh, staff people. And I want to uh, say that since I have been here, you have given me another idea about what could happen and where we may be able to go in the future. And that's why I'm inspired. And that's why I can't stay awake. <laughs> because my mind is so alive and burning. And I've been telling people about you. Okay? So you're going to be getting some visitors. <laughs> yeah, I've got the secret that I'm going to put it out. Okay? That you're all over the world and you're doing things with these young people and you're catching them while they're young. You know, my brother King went to college when he was young. Did you know that? Yeah, he was 16 years old when he was coming. You know why? Because the uh, war was on and they were recruiting a lot of young people and so they weren't going to college, so you had all that uh, space and room. So this president, okay, been amazed, decided what he would do is have early entrance. And Martin Luther King was selected <laughs> as one of those who started college early. Yes. And uh, that's why he went to university and finished his degrees early, because he started early. And uh, it was a blessing to him to be able to, to do that and to finish early because that meant he had more time to do his work and to fulfill his mission early on because he started early. And it's okay. I know about early. I used to get up at 7, well, 5.30 in the morning and uh, what she was talking about, and I used to be Mr. Coffee. I was in Tampa, Florida, grew up in Ebor City, and I would get out of bed and go one block over on uh, Broadway, and I would be able to uh, get coffee for the merchants who opened up their shops. In fact, I was sharing with the group earlier today, that's when I had my first sit-in, because I was actually there uh, ordering coffee for the merchants, Ten cents for the coffee, ten cents for me. <laughs> so I was really an entrepreneur. Right? <laughs> and I also you know, provided lunch for some of the students in school who didn't have lunch money. Because I had always had a pocket full of money. Okay? Lots of change. But while I was there waiting for the coffee so I could take it back to the merchants, there was a lunch counter. And of course, blacks were not allowed to sit in this lunch counter on the students. You could order, but you had to take out. And I was taken out. Of course, you know, I drank my own coffee at home. And, uh, but while I was there, I was talking back and forth. And I remember when I was seven years old, and I eased up on the stool, one leg at a time. And while I was sitting there, our eyes met in the mirror in front of the person who was preparing the coffee. And I remember that moment of truth, because I was talking all the time. And he looked out of the window, okay, to make sure nobody was observing me sitting on those stools. So I was accustomed to sitting on stools at lunch counters at the age of seven, <laughs> even in a segregated situation. I knew what I was doing. But sometimes you have to uh, be deliberate, okay? Not rush. We 
have to give others time to prepare their minds and their uh, capacity to perceive. You have to give them time for that to develop. So as we watched each other through the mirror, I showed no fear. No. So after all, I was the customer. I was bringing money to this restaurant that they would not have gotten because those merchants weren't going to leave their shops. I was Mr. Coffee. <laughs> and I had that responsibility. So from that time on, I continued to sit in as I got my order. So I was no stranger to sitting in once the sit-in started in Nashville. Uh, it was nothing new to me. And I knew it was okay, okay, to sit on the stools. <coughs> so, by the way, one thing I uh, don't tell too often, but I feel comfortable sharing it with you. When I was in college, in the sit-ins, before the sit-in started, I used to have another job working and that was washing pots and pans at one of the downtown stores, okay? Little restaurant, little shop. And so I got free lunch. Of course I had free lunch at school too. But I just, just used the lunch hour to do some more work. Because I was just a workaholic anyway. So I was down there working. And what happened is that um, uh, I would uh, wash the pots and pans and stuff during the lunch hour, and then I would have my lunch and then run back to school to class. Uh, this was in 1960, before the sit-in started. So what happened when the sit-in started, I got involved and I got uh, trained from Jim Lawson in 1959, and we were ready to go. And when the uh, <coughs> sit-in started, I was with it. I was probably the most experienced sit-in person today. <laughs> All right. So, the merchants downtown, when they knew we were coming, particularly during the lunch hour, they would lock their doors. And so here I was, leading the group, trying to find a place to sit in. And then it all of a sudden came to mind that I knew a place, because I worked there. <laughs> so I told my group, I said, follow me. And they followed me down the street, and went down around the corner, and we came up through the alley. And that's the way I used to come to work, by the way, through the alley. So they stayed back, and I knocked on the door, and they saw me. They opened the door, because they knew that, you know, I was coming to work. I put my foot in the door, and the rest of them came in. And we went straight on up to the front and sat in at those lunch counters. And the manager uh, was looking out the window uh, at the front, okay, with his door locked. And he came through the back door. <laughs> and as he slowly turned around to confirm the fact that what he'd seen through that reflection was true, there we were sitting at the lunch counters, his front door locked. He turned around and looked at me, and I looked at him. So the transformation took place. Yes, I did appreciate the job, but there was something more important than just simply having a job and earning money. I have sacrificed that job for a greater cause. And as we sat there, okay. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't completely comfortable with that. Because after all, I was an employee. And there is something about loyalty. But there's something greater than loyalty to a system that disrespects you. Why well, I could wash pots in the kitchen simply because of my ethnicity and my color. I could not sit down 
can eat at those lunch counters. So there's loyalty to a greater cause, not just an employer. And that was a transforming moment for me to realize that we must make personal sacrifices for a larger cause that's going to make a difference in the lives of others. At this point, we want to just simply look at a clip from that Nashville movement, and uh, we'll move on from there. So, if it's possible, Students at American Baptist College in Eastern Nashville know that segregation is being challenged, that some are working against the violent repression, even lynchings that enforce yeah, it. <laughs> they want to join the struggle. We've been taught one thing in the school about the Declaration of Independence, about the Bill of Rights, about the Constitution. And then in the, in the, in the real world, we were living something else. James Lawson, a Methodist minister from Ohio, soon gives Nashville's students a chance to take part. The soft-spoken Lawson is 30 and has spent three years teaching in India, where he studied the work of Mohandas Gandhi. In a small church near the Fisk campus, Lawson has started a series of evening workshops on nonviolent action. Uh, tonight we have a most important business to try to accomplish. Jim Lawson's manner is cool. His objective is breathtaking to eliminate segregation. His classes attract Nashville's brightest students. A good friend of mine in Alabama here last April was taken up by the KKK and beaten on a tree, he tied to a tree, beaten by chains and whatnot. I thought nonviolence would not work, but I stayed with the workshops for one reason, and that is because they were the only game in town. <laughs> That was the only group even trying to do anything to combat segregation that I knew about. They started praying, Father, uh, forgive these men. Jim Lawson has been encouraged to come south by Martin Luther King Jr., who says the civil rights movement needs leaders who understand non-violent strategy and tactics. Then they started protesting. You can't pray that prayer. Uh, uh, and the others said, yes, the man who's going to die has the right to pray any way he wants to pray. And this immediately started a vision among them. We took the whole group through a uh, holistic view of nonviolence. It's history, its roots in the Bible, its roots in Christian thought, uh, the methods of nonviolence. We told the stories of nonviolence. And I stressed the Gandhian idea of our being engaged in an experiment. It may have much more meaning to the attacker if as he strikes you on the cheek, you're looking him in the eye. Unfortunately, the concept of nonviolence for many people is that you get hit on one cheek, you turn the other cheek, you don't do anything. But nonviolence means fighting back. But you're fighting back with another purpose and with other weapons. Number one, your, your fight is to win that person over. And that is a fight. That's a struggle. That's much more challenging than fisticuffs. Um, we said we would desegregate downtown Nashville. Our first step was going to be desegregate lunch counters and restaurants. That, of course, was a first Gandhian step. That was the first step of nonviolence to uh, research and examine and focus on an issue. Choose the target, choose an issue. Months before going to the lunchrooms, Lawson begins preparing them. He wants them to have experienced both physical and verbal attacks and to learn how to resist the impulse to run or fight back. Now let's see what we've learned from 
this to us as to how uh, we might act non-violently, what are the basic problems there? You cannot go on a demonstration with 25 people doing whatever they want to do. They have to have a common discipline. And that's, that's a key word for me, that the difficulty with nonviolent people and efforts is that they don't recognize the necessity of fierce discipline and training and strategizing and planning and recruiting and doing the kinds of things that you do to have a movement. Uh, that, that, that can't happen spontaneously. It has to be done systematically. So, where are we? First of all, there's a history to the mystery. And one is being able to recognize our uh, previous uh, experiences and to learn from uh, leadership, such as the boy. I have an affinity uh, for him because I lived in Du Bois Hall as a student at Fisk University. <laughs> so every day and every night that I went to sleep, I was under his shelter. So uh, we did learn a lot about uh, Du Bois and his uh, approach in dealing uh, with uh, issues and his span. One of the things that's important for people to know is that uh, Booker T. Washington, for example, okay, and I live in Tuskegee, Alabama, so I see Booker T. Washington's statue periodically, okay, or frequently, uh, and they worked uh, together. A lot of people don't know that from the history. They seem to think that they were so much apart. It was Booker T. Washington that helped to fund the movement, okay, and the efforts and programs and lawsuits and all, like everything else, uh, the Du Bois uh, issued. So uh, <clears throat> leadership might differ, but the goals are the same. And what's important is to recognize those things that we have in common rather than overemphasizing things that are different. And that's the important thing for leadership to recognize. How do we bring together those uh, common goals and agreements? Like, for example, the Black Panthers, although we were involved in SNCC, which was called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, okay? Yes, there were those who were also involved. Now, a lot of people uh, look at the Black Panthers, for example, and the only thing they think about is somebody carrying some guns. Well, there were other folks who were carrying some guns. Even today, there's a big argument about carrying some guns. But I don't remember any record where the Black Panthers organizing a campaign to go and shoot up all of the senators in South Carolina, or North Carolina, or Mississippi, or organized to shoot up anybody. I don't remember that. What I do remember is the breakfast program, which became a national program, okay? Uh, suppose they were still in existence. What kind of programs would they have today? We'll never know because they were systematically, okay, uh, wiped out, or at least attempt to do that kind of thing. There were differences. But the question is whether the differences made a difference in terms of whites involved in the movement. It's important for us to understand that we might differ in colors and even in some of the cultures. You can't find people closer, okay, than you found folks who were together in the South. I was involved in the uh, campaign there in Nashville. We went on to the Freedom Rides, and then I went into uh, Selma, Alabama. That's what the book is all about, to give you the deep history of the mystery of Selma, Alabama, and how it really got started. 
okay, and the efforts that it took, when it was rejected, even by SNCC, he said, it doesn't make any sense to try to go into some Alabama. We sent two teams down there, and they came back with the same report. These are folks who have been involved in the movement now, folks who have been beaten up, arrested, and all that sort of thing, on the free miles. So they had no fear. But when they went to Southern Alabama, they came back with a report independently. You can't accomplish anything in Southern Alabama. And they had the same reason. What was that reason? White folks were too mean. Black folks were too afraid. Oh. Well, so there was an X on the map over Southern Alabama. So therefore, they were not going to start a voter registration campaign and so on. Had one in Mississippi, had one in Southwest Georgia, Mississippi, Bob Moses, Southwest Georgia, okay, Charles Sherrod, okay, all right. But not Southern Alabama. No. So when I went to get my assignment, they told me that, no, we don't have any more. Some is off the map, X. And they said, you can be assistant director in some of these other projects, but we don't have any more directorships. So, you know, if you want to go take a look at it, I said, no, I don't want to go take a look at it. I'll take it. If it's impossible, then that's my assignment. So, before I rushed down to Selma, Alabama, I went to the library. And guess what I was doing at the library? I was researching where I was going to do my research. <laughs> so what was I researching? Mean white folk. <laughs> <laughs> I know about mean white folk. <laughs> I'm the only one that's done a thorough research project called <laughs> Lean Life. I know. Okay? So, and uh, it's understood if you have mean white folks, you have scared black folks. <laughs> they go hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, that's how the system stays in place. Mm -hmm. But Selma, Alabama became uh, my project. And I found that in Tuskegee's library, Tuskegee Institute, that was one of the best places to do your research on mean white folks because they were the only institution, only library, where I could go where there was a publication of the White Citizens Council. Yeah. So I knew that the White Citizens Council met the last Thursday of each month in the a boardroom of the downtown bank. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And uh, so they were watching uh, the number of people who had registered to vote because you only could vote two days in uh, a month in Selma, Alabama. Okay? I think it was the, the, the second and the fourth Thursday or something like that. Okay? So they had this meeting. Uh, to be able to look. Because you know what? Uh, one of the requirements on the application for the voter registration is you had to have a registered person to vouch for you. So they wanted to see which white folks were vouching for black folks. Okay? They were systematic and they were thorough in their approach. They were serious white folks. Yes. And they'd already been uh, injured. Sometimes people who've been injured, they are the most ferocious because they never will forget the pain. And these folks in Selma, Alabama, in Dallas County, they have suffered pain. You know why? Because the capital of Alabama originally was in a place called Cahaba, right there. If that capital had stayed there, they'd had a big airport, they'd had a big university, you know, like a lot of capitals have, you know, all that kind of stuff, etc. But it was taken away from them. Taken to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, for a year. And then it, it brought it to Montgomery, Alabama. 
Those white folks in Selma, Alabama feel that they've been had. I was there when I walked in, and I used to just call and listen to white folks talk, because they don't mind talking. And they know white folks like it is. So what happened is I could hear them talking. You know what they were saying? They say those old politicians stole our capital. First, I thought they were talking about money. Stole our capital. <laughs> and I kept listening. And what these people in 1960, okay, three, they were still angry about the fact that the capital of Alabama was moved from their county. They were talking about holding a grudge. <laughs> yeah. But you know what they did when the movement started? Oh, I need to tell you this. On the Freedom Rides, the Fourth South, after we were beaten up in Montgomery, and I was on that bus that was beaten up, where we got put, where they just, uh, on the platform, they just beat us all up and stuff like that. And I remember I was on the bus as we came into uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, by this time they had the uh, National Guard on the bus. They said the governor wouldn't uh, allow us to get any protection earlier until the Kennedys came in, and then they decided they're going to let the you know, National Guard protect us. And then as we uh, got to the bus station, I realized something was very eerie. There was no more protection. Helicopters and squad cars and all that kind of thing, state troopers. No. It felt very quiet and lonely as the bus on a Saturday morning, okay, in a rural area, you know, a lot of folks all over the place. Uh-uh. Nobody in sight, no cars, <clears throat> nothing but the, you know, patrol car, uh, one little motorcycle, really, and guiding us to the bus station. I knew something was going on. So I stood up on the bus and I said to the uh, Freedom Riders, each of you get a partner and stick with that partner no matter what happens. If somebody needs to be with you, okay? You don't have to be alone. And the uh, head of the National Guard told me to sit out and shut up. I was a little skinny fellow, as you can see in that photograph. Because I've been sitting in a lot, so you know, I missed a lot of meals too. <laughs> <laughs> so I told the head of the National Guard, I looked at him, I raised my head, you know, to look him in the eye. You're in charge of the troops. I'm in charge of the freedom riders. And he didn't respond. So I continued my lecture to the freedom riders. And I told him the next thing is that no matter what happened to the mass meeting that night at uh, I think it was First Baptist Church. And so you needed to make your way to that church in case that we get separated, you know, or whatever. Well, the short of it is, I got um, kicked in the ribs on that platform. John Lewis got hit in the head with a Coca-Cola crate, and Bob uh, uh, Zellner, not Bob Zellner, but uh, I, I don't think it was his name. But anyway, uh, Jim's Word, Jim's Word from uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. He was on the Freedom Ride with us, and he was knocked over a rail five times. But the first time, he was unconscious. And he didn't know until two years ago when I told him, because I was there as a witness, that they picked him up and knocked him over five times. He was already unconscious. They tried to kick me in a certain place, and I went down to protect myself, and I got kicked in the ribs instead. So I went through the entire Freedom Ride the rest of the time with three cracked ribs. But so what can you do with cracked ribs? Suffer it to be so. Okay? But we continued. And uh, so the most important thing in that uh, movement was to keep moving. Yes. And the most important thing about moving is that you know where you are going. 
You've got to have a destination. But you must also realize that even though you have a destination, and our destination was New Orleans, more important than that is to have a destiny. Your destiny is more important than your destination. That's why when we got arrested in Jackson, Mississippi, we stayed in jail. 39 days, the appeal period, and we got out. We never continued our ride to New Orleans. First group flew by plane to continue and to culminate their uh, journey. We stayed in jail. We never made it to New Orleans. New Orleans was our destination but not our destiny. So in strategy, it's important for movements. There's a difference between a movement and a protest demonstration. Unless you go through the training, you will not appreciate you know, the difference. And that's why we're ever grateful for James Lawson, Jr., for what he did for us in Nashville. It's no coincidence that you had more people on Martin Luther King's executive staff and directors of program from the Nashville movement. It was equivalent to West Point because it trained leadership. You saw some of the examples. Even when we went down to test the situation, we returned and had a workshop and we uh, did a simulation. And we uh, did role play. The purpose of that was to educate our emotions. Yes. Because you can always have good intentions, but when you get into a situation and you have tension, you might not know how to respond. So it was conditioning us and conditioning our emotions to be able to respond in the most effective way. Now I've been through many uh, situations and I've uh, been the uh, national coordinator of the Poor People's Campaign, but I was also the national coordinator of the Spring Mobilization to end the war in Vietnam in 1967. So I'll tell you this little vignette. I was in Chicago working with the American Friends Service Committee and uh, Jim Bevel was up in New York trying to get a boat to go to, ship to go to uh, what, Hanoi, okay? And uh, he was going to take some peaceniks uh, 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 people and they were going to jump on the boat, a ship, and go to Hanoi. And uh, Martin Luther King in Atlanta called me because he knew I you know, was a good friend of Jim Bevel's. And he said, uh, uh, we need you to go to New York and get Jim Bevel and bring him back to Atlanta. I said, okay. My okay was, I understand what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. Sure enough, Bevel was into it. And he was so excited. He had a good artist who could draw. And they draw a picture of uh, President Johnson. Uh, with a Vietnamese baby in his mouth and blood dripping down on his throat. He thought that was just great, you know, to show vividly and graphically what was happening to the Vietnamese. Uh, so I asked him, how many people do you think you can recruit for this poster? <laughs> so you got to ask the right questions, you know. I didn't go fussing with him and everything. I said, oh, that's a really graphic picture. Yeah. He said, yeah, isn't that great? I said, well, I'm telling you, that artist really, <laughs> yeah. So then, um, <laughs> how many people are you going to recruit who would respond positively and join that campaign with the bloody baby in the mouth of Johnson. So I had to think about it for a while, etc. While you think about that, this boat that you, a ship that you want to, weren't you in the Navy? Yeah, I was in the Navy. Uh, I was a gunner. Yeah, I was a gunner. I remember you telling me about that. And we were, you know, uh, schoolmates back in Nashville and everything. Yeah. 
So, so suppose somebody gave you a ship so you could carry all of these uh, peace people on the ship to Hanoi, and they knew that the ship would sink once it got so far out in the ocean. They'd be glad to give you that ship, but it might not be ship uh, that would be seaworthy. You know, that could be a big trick, could it? And a short trip. Yeah. So I don't think it's a good idea for someone to give it to you, do you? Uh, well, maybe not. Uh, say, uh, but anyway, uh, let's talk about this uh, uh, big demonstration we're going to have in New York. <laughs> okay? This will be the Fifth Avenue Parade Committee. And then it turned out uh, the Spring Mobilization in the war in Vietnam. I became the national coordinator. We put about a million people in the street that day. Organized in, uh, in the park there in, uh, in New York. And the event was uh, going to be at the UN. And guess what? The one who sent me to New York to get Babel, and Babel recruited me to stay, uh, okay, that person became the keynote speaker, and that was Martin Luther King at the UN. So although he sent me to get Bevel, we ended up getting him <laughs> to come. And it was a you know, fantastic uh, march and demonstration and sort of thing. About 120 people, an organization rather, that participated. So I've gotten involved in those kind of things and uh, a lot of other things around the world. But the thing that really motivated me, and I'm going to stop at this point because we want to get some questions and some dialogue and discussion going, is that um, Martin Luther King uh, went to Memphis. He didn't want to go. We were in a staff meeting in Atlanta. All of us planning for the Poor People's Campaign. But Jim Lawson and some others asked him to come to help the sanitation workers because they were on strike. And they were just tired because they'd been on for a long time and nothing had happened, nothing changed. And they were walking around with signs on, just trying to get respect, you know, and nothing. So they asked Marcus King to come. And they said, well, if you could just come, Dr. King, and speak, and uh, we'll have a march, and you'll have a press conference, that would be you know, a way of giving a boost to these people. And it's an inspiration for them to go on, lift their morale. So he said, okay, you guys stay here and continue to discuss uh, the Poor People's Campaign, and I'll be right back. I'll just go to Memphis and do this one day and fly back. Uh-uh. That broken up in violence. Oh, and I should tell you, since I know, it was uh, agent provocateurs that broke up the march. The young black gang, okay, called the invaders. They're the ones who got downtown on the march and started breaking out windows. Martin Luther King supposed to have been killed that day. But the one traveling with him, Bernard Lee, put his head down and squished him out of there and got him in a car. And that saved his life for a few days. But the plot was already on to assassinate Martin Luther King. So when the march was broken up in violence, all of us in, uh, you know, Nashville, uh, Atlanta, caught planes, took off to Memphis, where we could continue our discussion and also reinforce the march <coughs> and over again so we didn't have violence. And all, every uh, executive staff person went except one, and that one was the one that didn't fly. In other words, he didn't catch planes. So he stayed. The rest of us there. And Martin Luther King was scheduled to be in Washington, D.C. And he was supposed to be at a press conference, and it's the 14th of you, uh, to announce the uh, Poor people's campaign. And uh, he said, Well, since I can't go, you're the national coordinator, you go. So I said, Okay. 
So that night we worked on the press statement, and uh, he was already in his pajamas, and he decided that uh, he wasn't going to go to the mass meeting, pouring down raining, everything at Mason Temple. But he got a phone call. And the phone call, okay, said, Martin Luther King, you got to come. Even though it's pouring down raining, people standing outside the rain, they don't want to hear from you. That's why they are there. The place is packed. This is your crowd. So he said, um, do you mean you want me to get out of my pajamas, put on my clothes and get dressed, and go out in the pouring down rain, and it's raining cats and dogs? Uh, are you telling me that that's what you want me to do? And I'm tired and I'm exhausted. Monesty was very exhausted. The answer was yes, you got to come. So he said, okay. So we started working on a press statement we made a use in Washington, D.C. And we said, we'll do it later. <coughs> so we went. That's when we made that mountaintop speech. Okay. He came back, he was euphoric. <laughs> no, he was already on the mountaintop. <laughs> he came back, so we couldn't work on a press statement. But the next morning, uh, Martin Luther King uh, and I were together, room 306. My room was 206. I still had my key. Yeah. So he said, uh, after we, he tweaked the uh, press statement, he said, uh, now Bernard, he always called me Lafayette, because the other guy was Bernard, you know, he could get us mixed up. He said, the next one we want to have is to internationalize and institutionalize <coughs> nonviolence. Come for later discussion. Okay. So, five hours later, I uh, landed into National Airport, that's what it's called then, it's called ready now. <coughs> nobody was there to pick me up. Walter Fontroy was supposed to pick me up, nobody was there. And I called and found out that there was a riot going on in the streets down there, and uh, they were trying to keep things quiet here in Stoke Carmichael. So, um, I grabbed the telephone booth, and there was one of those a rotating booth type thing where you get more than one phone. While I was on the phone, I didn't listen to the ticker tape from AP, Associated Press, and UPI, United Press International. This white reporter from UPI broke down in tears. I could hear him weeping in my ears on the phone. That's how I learned that Martin Luther King had died. I knew he was shot, but everybody gets shot doesn't necessarily die. And it didn't occur to me that Martin Luther King was going to die. So they put a hit on Martin Luther King. Yeah. No question about it. It wasn't James Earl Wright. Mm -hmm. No. And we know for a fact, because a police friend of mine who was over homicide investigations and that kind of thing went with me to Memphis, Tennessee, and we went to the bathroom where the shots supposedly been fired, and he uh, positioned himself, okay, behind the bathtub, which was in front of the window, and he, okay, he said, no, the only way that this a weapon could have been used to kill Martin Luther King from this angle, the person had to be left-handed. James Earl Ray was not left-handed. But I didn't spend a lot of time, you know, on the investigation of who killed Martin Luther King and where and how and all that kind of stuff. I was remembering his last words to me, and that is to institutionalize and, inst and uh, and internationalized nonviolence. So that's what I've been working on for the last, okay, years to make sure it happened. ABP, I know I got somebody in the audience. We started that in 75 in Green Haven, okay, upstate New York. It's an over, I talked to uh, Cluck, Roger Cluck, and it's in over 60 countries now around the world. 
a training program for inmates, alternative to violence project. So that's what I've been doing. They're all over, uh, you know, Latin America, Colombia. In Colombia, we have a, a prison, okay, Bella Vista, which is now a nonviolent center. The inmates teach nonviolence. I went there last year, a couple of years ago, and guess what? There's a place out in the community where they're training young people in nonviolence. And you know who the trainers are? Former police officers training young gangs in nonviolence. The other thing is not only they're uh, former police officers, they're also former inmates themselves. They learn nonviolence by being <coughs> inmates. And now they're training these young people. I mean, what ADP has done all over the world is just tremendous. And that's why I uh, continue to do this work. The results are just phenomenal. People don't even know. That's the deepest, darkest secret. And that is the number of Martin Luther King centers that are training nonviolence all over the world. Okay, his birthday is celebrated in over 100 countries. Martin Luther King, this fellow. Okay? There's only one person whose birthday is celebrated in more countries. And you know who that is. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And Martin Luther King told me April 4th, that morning, for me to go on to Washington, D.C., and he's going to come behind me, and he'll be there, you know, in Washington, D.C., for me to go ahead. And guess what? What, three or four years ago? He shows up, 30 foot tall, <laughs> on the hall. Why do the king man of his word? He <laughs> said, how long it will take him to get there? <laughs> and there he was. I went to see him, you know? Yeah. And other things I close. I hope the question answers. It was a hit that they put on mine with the king. But it was a miss. They weren't trying to just bury Martin Luther King in a graveyard somewhere. That's not why they shot and killed him. They were trying to stop this whole nonviolent movement that he started because it was changing the country. Every, and more rapidly, change was taking place. Okay? Yeah. So, it was a hit, but it was a miss. Yeah. They missed. Because even right now, as we speak, we're talking about Martin Luther King and his nonviolent goal of establishing institutes, okay, and teaching people alternatives to violence, helping people empower themselves so they can help empower their communities, helping people find other ways of managing conflict in their lives and in their institutions. It was a hit, but it was a miss. And we're going to work to make sure that they keep on missing. Thank you. How could you go on? 
Well, we have a suspicion that Martin Luther King was aware that his days were numbered. In fact, that same year, earlier, he preached his own eulogy. And he talked about what he didn't want to, uh, to happen at his funeral. And one of the things he said, and maybe some of you have read it or heard it, I don't want people to say that I have a PhD. I don't want folks to tell how many honorary doctorate degrees I have. I just want somebody to say that uh, Martin Luther King tried to feed the poor. He tried to close the neck. He tried to shelter uh, the homeless. He, he tried. And he uh, talked about all the things he had once said at his uh, funeral. The other thing is when he recruited me out of Chicago, uh, he called me earlier, and uh, you know I was uh, off doing a thing, but you know I was working for Quakers and American Friends Service Committee. Anything I wanted to do to support the movement, they were behind it. Okay, they just gave me a leave of absence with pay. <laughs> you know, I say go do your thing, <laughs> all right, and bring as many as you want with you. So uh, actually, I waited almost. Uh, Oh, a month before I responded. Mama King called me again. He said, I thought you told me uh, that you were going to come down here. I need you here. I said, well, I thought you were going to send me a job description. <laughs> a job description. You cut that in and write it. You know, in the movement, tell me the job description. But I've been working with the Quakers, you know, so. <laughs> hospitalization. They had you know, all kinds of insurance programs and, and vacation, you know, <laughs> retirement program, you know, and uh, they even had paternity leave. Did you know that? Back in the early 60s, the Quakers had paternity leave. If your wife got pregnant, you can pretend, you know, and you can stay home. Knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> 22 cents a mile. <laughs> So I said, Dr. King, whatever you want me to do, you know I'm going to do that to help you out. He said, no, I need you to come here. Because we are reorganizing the SCLC. And I need you to be part of that. He said, this may be my last campaign. We are going for broke. But the poor people's campaign, they want you to come because they're going for broke. Well, that's the way to recruit somebody. <laughs> So I went, understanding that my mother King was going to make sure we were broke. <laughs> so, uh, there were a lot of indication, indicators. When he saw what happened to Kennedy, for example, Martin Luther King said, okay, that's what's going to happen to me. So it was that eerie feeling, and uh, we didn't know when it was going to happen, of course, or how it was going to happen. But Martin Luther King was uh, not blind to the fact that, uh, okay, he was getting close to the end. He was 39 years old. And you know, the older I got, the younger that seems. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we resist he resisted the thought of it and the idea, but he kept reminding us, okay, the real key to it, which we knew, that he was ready to go is the way he structured the organization. He was a president. He had a first and a second and a third vice president. Then he organized his internal structure that was Martin Luther King, the president, and Andrew Young, the uh, executive vice president, uh, the director. Then he had a director, executive director, and uh, Andy was over him as the, okay, uh, vice president, director, or whatever, okay? And then I was over the staff, program administrator, and all that kind of stuff, etc. So he put people in place, and he made Abernathy, even though Abernathy was the treasurer of the organization, he made him the vice president at large. So he had four vice presidents. 
because he was one to be prepared, okay, in case the other people went down, there'd be somebody left somewhere to continue. So we became suspicious that uh, he was preparing, okay, for his uh, demise. Uh, of course, we did everything we could to protect him and surround him and do what we could to uh, extend his uh, longevity. But the time had come and we couldn't do it anymore. My surprise is that more of us want to kill. Look at the balcony. You saw those other leaders on the balcony, Jesse Jackson and Jose Williams and all that. was my surprise that more of us want to kill. And I still don't know why. Now, when I was in Selma, they tried to kill me. And that was a three-state conspiracy. Ben Elton Cox, who was with the uh, core Congress of Racial Equality, he was on the first Freedom Ride out of Washington, D.C. And uh, Medgar Evers in Mississippi, and I was in Selma. They couldn't find Ben Elton Cox, who wasn't home that night. They got Medgar Evers, and I was attacked in front of my house the same night. And of course, I survived the miracle. But uh, that's all detailed in the book. But uh, we knew that we were risking our lives. And we had to prepare for it. But you know what happened? They came to take Martin Luther King's life. But it was too late. He had already given his life. They couldn't take his life. He'd given it to a cause that he believed in. And no matter what happened, okay, he died for filling that cause. I love Dr. King's Riverside Church speech, which was given April 4th, 1967, where he talked about the Vietnam War, and he put it all together. It was an anti-war speech, um, and you talked about your uh, being involved in that as well. And I know that that, at least I've heard that that had, you know, split the movement, that there were many in the movement who did not want him to go down that route of the talking about the economics, talking about colonialism, uh, as well as racism. <clears throat> and I just wondered if you could address that. Um, there was just on television uh, a, a little documentary about Whitney Young, and I think he might have been one of those who did not agree with Dr. King uh, in that regard. And I thought maybe Byron Drustin was another one. Could you just address that? Is that true that it really split the movement that he started to go in that direction? Um. There were leaders, oh, I should explain this to you. What happened is this. When black leaders start uh, identifying with the anti-war movement, or we call it the peace movement, some of them were concerned that support for their own organizations and civil rights would diminish, and that many of the whites who were we used to call them liberals in those days, okay, rather than progressives or whatever. <laughs> and they get called different names too, like you know, blacks and African Americans and colors. Okay, white get called names too. Okay, so anyway, um, they thought that would take away from the support from the civil rights struggle, financial support, and also identity and that kind of thing with the movement. So some of them were concerned about that. Okay? Because their mission was very simple and very narrow. Okay? So, yes, they did. But 
they also wanted to just stick with their programs, like the March on Washington. Initially, you mentioned Whitney Young, so I can mention that, and Roy Wilkins and some of the others, did not support Martin Luther King initially with the March on Washington. And they had good reason. They said, if you get all these angry black folks up there in Washington, D.C., they'll start a riot. And that'll set, back the, set the movement back 50 years. Well, to their surprise, okay, but the way they started supporting Martin Luther King and getting on board is when their membership started, you know, supporting the March on Washington. All right? Yeah, like the NAACP chapter is called the National Office of the NAACP and said, where do we park our buses? Because the buses were coming. Okay? So the key thing is that Martin Luther King used his skill to unite people and bring them together, even when they were separated. And they had different ideas, and they were at odds with each other. Sometimes his staff was at odds like the corporate campaign, all of the staff people did not support the poor people's campaign, even though Martin Luther King announced it, and that was his idea, and what he wanted to do, okay? And he got the idea from Marion Mike Carolyn. Mm -hmm. That's where he got the idea. But it was his idea. <laughs> Okay, because otherwise there's been some discussion. But it was his idea that we mount this campaign, go on to Washington, D.C., and bring news and all that kind of thing. All right? People get on board once they see that things going to happen, even without them. So, that happens. Okay, so we we'll, we'll recognize that's a fact. So that did happen. All right? And uh, on the peace movement and that kind of thing. Martin Luther King was reluctant himself. Initially, the one person that encouraged Martin Luther King and supported him and persuaded him to take a stand against the war in Vietnam, Coretta Scott King. She went to Antioch. She was involved with the International Women's League for Peace and Freedom, whatever. Okay, she was the one that had, uh, you know, given that uh, encouragement and that support to do that. Now remember, Martin Luther King's board of SCLC rejected the whole idea of taking a stand, okay, against the war. So it wasn't just those other leaders. It was Martin Luther King's own board of directors. And it was Daddy King who stood up in the board meeting, okay, and said, yes, Martin Luther King, all right, may be the president of SCLC, but he's also co-pastor of a church. He's also a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. He's a lawyer, okay? He's an individual with his own conscience. He just happened to be the president of SCLC. So he can take a stand as an individual, but he must follow his conscience. Martin Luther King said himself, I have fought against segregation too long now to segregate my conscience. Okay? And so without the support of his board, he took that stand. Now I understand that, see a lot of these people you're talking about, ministers and everybody else, some of them have gone to the war. Well, even on his staff, Jose Williams, okay, Jim Bevel, you go down the list, all right? Yeah, okay. Many people have gone to the war. And for them to take a stand against the war meant that you're taking a stand against a position that your country has taken. So, that's to be understood. All right, that people have that. They were doing funerals of Vietnamese soldiers every weekend. The same ministers we're talking about. You're going to get in the pulpit over the eulogy and say, well, I'm sorry, he made a mistake. I don't think so. So they had all of these forces that 
brought them to the position that they could not take a stand against their country. And that whole adage about when your country's at war, right or wrong, you stand with them. Okay? Without understanding that if we stop the war in Vietnam, we'll save our country. All right? And so you have a difference there. But Martin Luther King was a synthesizer. And he understood positions, but he was also, you know, a Galean in bringing the differences together to make a synthesis. That was one of his greatest arts. And I want to quickly say that Diane Nash had the same characteristics, and that's why we had her as a spokesman for the Nashville movement. I was a spokesperson, and also I was a spokesperson for the Freedom Rides. And she's the one person who we knew had the similar skills of Martin Luther King <coughs> and being able to reconcile differences among people and be able to keep them moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about he was hit, but they missed. And they certainly did because of the work and your work and others work with the alternatives to violence projects. I wonder if you could give us a few uh, uh, wonderful things that has happened out of that. Clearly the training by, by former inmates and by law, um, police officers, <coughs> to present inmates about nonviolence, but I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about what that, what that, how that has impacted not only here in this country, but other places in the world. Okay. Um, Honey Knock was the one that recruited me to go to uh, Green Haven. Uh, she was unusual because she was a federal prison visitors program. And she was out actually in El Reno, Oklahoma, where she first sent for me to go. I had never heard of El Reno, Oklahoma. There was a riot out there in the prisons, and they were asking for some help in helping to do some nonviolent training. So she told me I had to go. So I do what women tell me to do. <laughs> I mean, you'd be better off if you did. Why do you know him? She has more nodules on her brain than men. Did you know that? Yeah, that's the uh, psychiatrist. Women got more nodules on the brain. They are much more versatile and do different things. That's why they can carry on five conversations at one time. <laughs> and then say, so, could you just wait just a minute and hear one okay, one at a time. Yeah. Now, women they could just go right on. <laughs> no, that's a word. Just go from one conversation to another and just over here. No, that's not true. It was Thursday night. <laughs> 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 I just want to explain that to men because sometimes, you know, it's not in the literature, you know? <laughs> Five sisters, you, you know, I listen to them very carefully. <laughs> my grandmother, and, you know, that's where I learned a lot of stuff. I know everything it is to be known about older women. I love my grandmother. So you don't have any secrets for me. <laughs> I know everybody. Book <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been written yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, um, what is the question? <laughs> So I went out there and uh, we did some training in South uh, El Reno, Oklahoma. So we quieted that riot down and uh, got people squared away. That was my beginning to uh, do training workshops in nonviolence in prison as uh, a non inmate. We did it when we were inmates, of course. Okay. But uh, then Green Haven uh, in uh, New York and that kind of thing. Uh, what we basically did was help people understand the basic principles of nonviolence and help them understand about conflict and also
also we have to understand that they had the power within had to go outside. But with nonviolence, you didn't have to go look for your weapon, okay? Or see if you had some bullets, because you have a gun and no bullets and it won't work, okay? Nonviolence was a force of, you know, of empowerment to the individual. You can step out of the shower fully armed. Yeah, ready to go to work. <laughs> okay. And so what people realized that there was that alternative. That's why we call it alternative violence. And uh, we took the inmates in Green Haven, for example, and trained them in nonviolence. And guess what the authorities did in New York? They sent those lifers, because that's what we trained. Some of the leaders who were lifers. And we took and they took them down to Goshen, which is a juvenile facility in New York, downstate, one of the juvenile facilities. And those inmates from uh, you know from uh, Green Haven trained these young people in nonviolence. All right? And there was an incident that took place which is not known and most of us who were involved have moved on, like the angels and people like that. That was the last name of a couple of angels. Uh, and I share that with you. What happened was that they brought these uh, inmates who were down there training in Goshen up to back to Green Haven, since we were doing another training, they had experience, so we wanted them to share their experience with the new inmates who were being trained. And in prison they're very strict. I mean, they even count the meals based on the inmates, okay, that they have. And guess what? Those inmates who were down in uh, Goshen, when they returned to work with us, they were not on the meal list. And the rest of us, okay, went out of the prison to lunch. And the inmates who were lifers came with us so they could eat. I was standing out there in front of the prison and these inmates got so nervous and scared because those police officers who worked in the prison knew them and they might not have known that they were, and here they were free. For all those years they never set foot free and here they were out there on the curb waiting for the car to come pick us up and take us to lunch. And boy, you're talking about somebody who was and these big bad Joe and all that, they were as scared as they could be. So I stayed with them, all right, in case there was an incident or whatever. But they, I mean, can you imagine? So reconciling that whole idea of being afraid to be free, okay? Freedom is something you yearn for and you struggle for. But it's not safe when you're a lifer and you're out there surrounded by prison guards. And that was my first opportunity to see such brave inmates, okay, tremble like leaves. So I told them, I said, I'm with you and I'll take care of any confrontation, so don't worry. And I'm with you. Okay? This program expanded all over the world. In countries that I don't even know, I got a partial list of countries. Because they had to remove the contact uh, people, names, because of the, you know, uh, illegal things that people do with devices and emails and stuff. So I just really got that because I just met with Roger Cluck, who was the head of the United States, uh, you know, group. And he's been, you know, replaced now and retired. I just met with him this past week. But it is now in, what I said, over 60 some countries around the world. That's why you don't have riots in prison because the inmates learn 
from the ABB program, how to manage conflict. It doesn't disappear, but it's managed. And that's the important thing that people learn. And as I say, it's in you know, over 60 some countries around the world and places. And some of it's now not just in the prison, it's in the community as well, where they're training for it.
And by, you know, 8.30 at night, whatever, you, you had to go back to sleep. And they insisted you, okay, the lights are out. So that routine becomes a limiting factor of your being able to make judgments and decisions and that kind of thing, etc. And you're absolutely right that what has happened is that the system is designed to put particularly, all right, people of color behind bars and for long periods of time. Now that's by design, all right? And I would have to say that there are sources in the government that tell me that it's purposeful. I don't know. Three strikes you out? Okay, no. Three strikes you in. And how long are you going to be sentenced? How is it that some people get sentenced for so many years and others get sentenced for multiple years doing even less damage or violation? That's because we have judges. Okay? You know, relationships between prosecutors and judges and the entire system, police officers and everything else. That system uh, emphatically, not tends to, be at the disadvantage of people of color. So that's why you have such a large number of people of color in the prison system. That has to change. And then you're denied the right to vote. So, I don't know. so it takes away your ability to do that. Job, you know, it's one of the questions they ask you on the application. They called me uh, about five years ago in Alabama and asked me if I wanted my uh, record, my arrest record, expunged. Okay? After all these years now. now. Okay, that's me if I wanted to expunge. That depends on them. You know, to get jobs. I've been in deep trouble. <laughs> you know what I told them? No. That's my record. Don't erase it. Okay? Yeah. Too late for you to erase it. Didn't do any good. Anyway. Alright? So I want my arrest record, okay, to be permanent. Don't bother with it. You didn't ask me if I wanted to be arrested, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be racist. Okay. I didn't make the record. You did. All right. I was exercising my rights. You made the record. That's your record anyway. It doesn't belong to me. All right. Yeah. That's your decision to put me behind bars and to charge me. Not mine. Okay? So. <clears throat> This is something we've got to correct. How do we go about correcting that? Number one, let's look at uh, patterns. Number one, every five children out of seven who have parents in jail will go to jail. It's a pattern. So how do we break up that pattern? We have to reach those children, identify those children who don't have parents or, or they want their parents in jail, and we have to become the godparents. And we have to work with them and give them opportunities, spend time with them, and all that sort of business, etc. Like one of the things that uh, we have to realize is not the experiences that people have that makes them. So, uh, if you grow up in a certain community and you got certain this, that, and other parents and all that kind of stuff, or, uh, that will, okay, your experience, the experience makes the person. Yeah, to some extent, but not. Mm -hmm. It's that person's interpretation of their experiences that determines okay, their judgments and decisions. Like some folks say, there's too much violence on television. Every time you're out of there, 
all that violence and shooting and all that, and those games that they play. No, it's the interpretation. Because you can have the same children growing up in the same home, same neighborhood, same, 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 same grandparents, whatever. One goes in one direction, one goes in another direction. Same experience, but it's their interpretation of those experiences. That's why grandparents got to spend time with their little grandchildren and not watching TV or playing games. They got to talk to them about how, what they are experiencing and help them to come out with some meaningful evaluation of their experiences. Balance is not to be replicated. Balance is to be condemned. But they can see the balance and they can just, that's what they do. They decide whether they're going to replicate or whether they're going to, okay. Eradicate. So that's why we had the Godfathers program. Because we became godparents of those who didn't have parents that, you know, out of jail. So we have to you know, do what we can, find some way, all right, to communicate, talk to them, give them encouragement, and move ahead. Partial answer. And someone was next. Okay. Where's that time? Well, in that case, I got to send a song to you. Y'all <laughs> <laughs> know all the film songs, so I'm not gonna sing no film song. All right, the movie. What happened is. When I was in Nashville studying my New Testament uh, material for my New Testament class, I uh, tried to find me a good station so I could hear some good old music, okay, put me in the right mood. And every station I turned to was Hillbilly. I'm making my heart of peanuts, I'm captain of them, calling crickets, even litters. <laughs> Up and turn to you and you're ready to off. Then I said to myself, wait a minute, I'm listening to this sound and this uh, kind of twang and all that, but what I need to do is listen to the words. So I turned it, but you're back on again. And you know what I heard? It was a song, it was a hillbilly, country music type, and it was about Jim Folsom, who was the former governor of Alabama. It was a song about him. And at this point, he was a senator in Alabama. And this guy, okay, six foot eight, all right, almost 300 pounds, had given a little white girl a ride. Coleman, Alabama. Six months later, the little girl, yeah, no, not six, nine months later, the little girl end up with a little girl. They had to drop out of school, try to get some money on the streets and all that. And that's what this song was about. Yeah, these are white folks singing about white folk. And you know how the song went? She was poor, but she was honest. When she met that Christian gentleman, Fitchin Folsom, and she had a child by him. It's the rich who gets the glory. It's the poor who gets the blame. It's the same the whole world over. Now ain't that a dirty crime shame? Now he says in the legislature, Making laws for all mankind While she roams the streets of Coleman, Alabama Selling grapes from her grapevine It's the rich who gets the glory It's the poor who gets the blame 
is the same the whole world over. Now it's that a dirty crime train. Now the moral of the story is to never take a ride from a Christian gentleman, big Jim Folsom, and you may be a virgin bride.